Happy Sunday, and uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it really is an honor, and uh, I'm humbled to be here to talk about the Holy Spirit today, which is uh, Pentecost Sunday, which is the birthday of the church. And um, yeah, it's wonderful that I can come here, and most of you don't know me, and I don't know most of you either, and I've only been here for, you know, like a month or something like that in this area. And, but it's wonderful as Christians, it's different. It feels like I compare it to children when you put them in a playground like at McDonald's or something and they're able to just gel with each other straight away because there's a there's a familiarity there's there's a there's a a, a common joy of wanting to share the moment together even though they don't know each other even though they don't have you know knowledge of where one's come from or anything like that but you can straight away start gelling and straight away start seeing things that that bring you together and um, yeah, I've, I was uh, pondering on that scripture all week, the John 14 one. And it's quite a mysterious one because it talks, it's, it's one uh, that describes the Trinity um, and the mysteriousness of the Trinity, that God is the Father, that God is one, as we're told from the very beginning in, in the New Testament, in the, in the Old Testament. But somehow Jesus is not just a separate thing from the Father, because he says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. So somehow they're one, but somehow they're not. And then the Holy Spirit, um, Jesus later goes on to say in John 15, that he likens, when after he said that the Holy Spirit will be in you, he describes that as he and the Father living in you. So somehow the Holy Spirit living in on the inside of you is Jesus and the Father living inside of you. And so it's mysterious. And also in that conversation there that Jesus is having, he, he does still say that the Father is greater than I. So there is a mystery there. Um, I was not Christian all my life. And so I found these thoughts and these ideas quite difficult. And it's part of the reasons why it took me a long time to become a Christian. Um, I was raised Muslim. And as a Muslim, we're taught very similar things to what's in the Bible and the Torah. Um, the oneness of God is really, really important to Muslims. It's the central foundation of things. And the belief for the Muslims is that that's how people began to go astray when they started to move away from absolute monotheism, the Arabic word is Tawheed. To, to move yourself away from Tawheed is like a natural human inclination that they want to steer clear from as much as possible. And so this was driven in me quite from an early age. I was very interested in God, very interested in the history of the prophets. And there was a lot of death in my family. And so I was, I was faced with the big questions very, very early in life. Um, you know, my father died very young when I was very young and my mother had cancer and she was going to die too. And there was lots of things like that. So I was always asking the question of, is there a God? Is there a meaning to life? And is there one way to God? Or, you know, is it multiple or is it all an accident? And if I had been born in another religion, if I'd been born in a Sikh family, would I be Sikh and would that make that right? And I was always quite a serious kid. And, um, and so I used to always think these sort of thoughts all the time. It scared me. And Islam, it made a lot of sense to me because it's very logical. It sort of accepts the idea of God and God being one. And that there was a Jesus and he was a good man. He was a prophet, but that's it. He was the Messiah to the Jews, but that's it. And it's left there. And the mystery aspect of God and our relationship with him is taken away. And so everything's just purely human and logical. It makes a lot of sense to the human mind. A little bit later, though, I began to start thinking, is this right? Is this true? Just because it makes sense to the human mind. I was very, very attracted to Jesus. But I was also aware that how can we know anything about Jesus? You know, it was a very, very long time ago and many different groups and religions, even within Christianity, have very different, had very different views of what Jesus is and was. From the very beginning, 
you know, there were the Gnostics who came in the Christian circles quite early, and they were describing Jesus as a very, very different thing. Very, very early on, you had a, a sect of the, of, of the Gnostics called the Docetics, who believed that Jesus was just an apparition. He wasn't even human at all. If he walked on a beach, he wouldn't have left a footprint because he's not real. Um, you had someone like Basilides who believed that Jesus never died on the cross, but, but his likeness was given to another and that other person died on the cross. And so these thoughts were going around quite early. And even now, if you switch on, you know, um, the History Channel or something like that, or National Ge Geographic, and, you, and they, they seem to be uh, wanting to talk about Christ, like at Easter time or Christmas time. But they always sort of paint Jesus as this very sort of unchristian, uh, or you know, very un unbiblical uh, view of him, you know, from a very sort of secular atheist point of view. You know, Reza Aslan is a very famous writer and Christian historian stroke theologian. And he describes Jesus as being a very misunderstood Palestinian who had a few things to say about the corruption of, of society at the time and the rulership. And he was, he was, he was crucified because for, for sedition, for being against the Roman Empire. And so there are all these sort of different views about Jesus. And I thought, how can we ever really know about who he is? And lots of these early um, heresies that I mentioned about the, Do the Docetics and the Gnostics, the, Romans, the, the Roman church removed much of these people who didn't toe the line into places like Syria. And Syria was a bigger area at the time. It included even Jerusalem and Israel. It included Arabia. And so when people were outcast out of the Roman Christian system and empire because of their um, unorthodox beliefs, there became a, a sort of a, a breeding ground for these ideas. And in a certain place in Arabia, these ideas came together and you had a group of people who said the Christians are arguing all the time at the moment about what is the nature of the Trinity, what is the nature of God and they decided to say well there is no Trinity, God is one, la ilaha illallah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger and they began to create this religion that removed all of these things because they had the benefit of hindsight. This was like in the seventh century. So they'd, they'd seen all the arguments that are going on in the Christian world and they were able to create something that was quite an answer to it. That made a lot of sense to me. And so I kind of went with that. I, I liked Christianity, but I felt I can't really know this Jesus person as a, as a Muslim we just believe him to be a man of God and, and he did miracles and he did great things. And to say anything more than that, you know, the, the, chap um, the chapter two and three of the Quran, it says to say more than that, it's almost like the heavens being torn asunder out of disgust for you attributing things to God, i.e. him having a son. So these are, these are things that were very, very difficult for us to get our heads around. And so it stopped me from being a Christian for a long time. And as I grew more and more as a person and followed Islam more and more and more, I was still not satisfied with it. And I was still attracted to this Jesus person. And so eventually I started doubting myself and wondering, you know, am I being corrupted? I'm from London, by the way, I'm from England. Am I being corrupted by the West? Am I being sort of like, um, led astray by Western thinking and maybe if I go to um, Mecca I'll have my beliefs more reinforced and I'll be able to kind of you know uh, be touched because I heard I'd heard all my life that people who go to Mecca you're touched with such a sense of holiness that people faint when they see the Kaaba or when they go around you know the Kaaba in Mecca and you're touched with such an and a holiness that people faint all the time. And so I thought, I want, I want that experience because maybe this will help me to understand a little bit more where I stand because I have more and more doubts. And so I decided I will go to Mecca. And just before I went to Mecca, some people, um, I was walking through Leicester Square 
and some outreach of Hillsong actually were doing some outreach at the time. And then they spoke to me and stopped me in the street and told me about Jesus. And I said, look, I know all about your Jesus. I know about it, but I would love for you to answer some questions for me. And because I go out and I argue with Christians and I, 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 I know your scriptures very well. And I want you to explain to me why was Jesus screaming out on the cross when he was dying and he's screaming out and, and he, he believes that God's left him. And why is it that, you know, he gets tired and he gets hungry and it just doesn't make sense. And some of these questions, you know, I, they were answered. Some of them were not answered. And so I found it quite unsatisfactory, let's say. And so I went to Mecca and I did the, what was the, the Umrah, the pilgrimage. And um, as soon as I landed there, I, I remember thinking, this is beautiful because the heat and the desert, I was able to imagine the prophets and thinking this is probably something like where they come from. And this is more of a reality of the Quran and the Bible and all of that than London. So, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it when I was there, but it didn't take me long to realize that this is very human religion. It's very human. And when I went to the Kaaba and I was seeing the people go around it, as I was going around it as well, you realize that it's human enthusiasm that makes people fall over and faint. It's almost even human rudeness. You know, it's people trying to take their sandals off to get in and somebody's running over them. So this is just re religious zeal that I could even tell them this is not holiness as such. This is not, this is not true. This is not the truth for me. And after a while of that, I was going around the Kaaba and I asked, you know, this is, this is really bad from a Muslim point of view, but I said, Lord Jesus, if you are real, please show me who you are. And it, but God, if that is not true, then forgive me, Allah, forgive me for what I just said. My doubts had gotten to that, um, to that uh, limit. And I just stayed doing that, you know, for the two weeks that I was there or wherever it was. And when I came back, um, I was in a Japanese restaurant eating some sushi. And um, I went downstairs to wash my hands and a gentleman was there and he was, he was American. And he said, he said, you know, I like the English because you use uh, hand dryers. He said, in America, we waste too much paper towels. That might have been true at the time, I don't know. But he said, we waste too much paper towels in America. And in England, you've got the hand dryers. And I said, and this was in a you know, bathroom, so I didn't really want to have a chat. And uh, he said, um, you're being called. Do you know that? And I looked at him and I said, and it didn't seem weird to me that he said that. And I said to him, I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And he went, yeah. He said, you were as well, weren't you? I said, well, when I was a little boy, I called on Christ. Yeah, I did. When I was 10 years old, I had these dreams about him. But I'm a Muslim and I, it doesn't make sense to me what you guys believe. And he said, well, you walked away from him, but he didn't walk away from you. He's always been there. He's been watching you. He said, um, can I pray for you? And I said, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to uh, make you do that. You know, it's in, in Islam, it's called shirk. Shirk is idolatry. So if you have the name of Jesus or any other name other than Allah, it's, it's forbidden. And in Islam as well, you're highly recommended, instructed never to question the faith because the belief is if you start questioning it, God will open you up to more misguidance because if you've had faith, which is called Iman, if you have Iman and then you start doubting, God will punish you for that and make you have more doubt until you leave the fold. And so I was scared that, that was, that's what was happening to me. And it was only after some time that I decided that I do need to take this seriously and see if I am being called. But it was a huge, a huge fear for me. And I also felt like, how would I ever know that I've made the right choice? I, I actually resented being alive because I felt it's like Russian roulette. I could pick a religion out of any of these religions. And one of them's true and the rest are not true. What am I going to do? And that's where it is relevant to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit 
is where the rubber hits the road. It's, it's the crooks on everything that this whole thing hangs on. Because as Christians, the difference with us is that we don't just give people a list of laws or a list of rules or even a, a set of propositions where we can say, this is a better worldview than this one or this is more historic than this one. It's not all about apologetics, even though that's helpful. There's something about our faith that we invite people and we invite ourselves to come into an experience with God that somehow we will know Jesus, that Jesus isn't just what people say he might be. It's not just a bunch of opinions that we'd never know if it's true or not, but that we have access, we have invitation to the Holy Spirit that comes on the inside of us so that when we hear him, we actually hear the words of Jesus and that when we read the scriptures with the Holy Spirit, we hear God. It's different to every other system you know, Paul says it in, as well, 2 Corinthians 3, when Paul talks about when the believers, the Jews, read the scriptures, it's like a veil is over them and they don't see it for what it is. It requires the Holy Spirit to remove that veil. And then when you do that, when you're reading scripture, it comes alive to you so that it's not just a book. And that's something to, to keep in mind when we, when we witness to other people as well that it's not just we give them a book, because when they read it, actually, it might not make a lot of sense to them. Sometimes Paul is talking about some things that you wonder, what is he talking about? Honestly, like sometimes he's talking about, you know, I built on someone else's thing and they, you know, and I'm, and so if you give that to somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, you know, it's, it's you might think, well, what is this? And so the Holy Spirit is really important for us to read script, in order to be able to even read scripture, for scripture to come alive to us. It helps us to worship, you know, in John 4, when, 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 when the lady at the, the well speaks to Jesus and Jesus starts saying that you'll have water uh, on the inside of you, you'll have wells coming up on the inside of you, meaning the Holy Spirit. And he said, God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's different to what I had as a Muslim where we were forced to worship at certain times of the day. And it had nothing to do with a connection with God. God was seen as very far away he is above and beyond, and he doesn't dirty himself with the things of creation. He's the creator, we're the created. There is no umbilical cord between he and us. He just watches from a distance and he gives us his law. And out of fear and reverence, you do as you're told. And that's how I lived my life. And fear only has a limited amount that it can motivate a person before they start turning dark and rotten and it's 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 only the holy spirit that allows us to worship god in spirit and in truth otherwise it becomes something crazy you know religion can be crazy and that's when i saw you know people running over each other in mecca not caring about the other person because they wanted to get to the more holy place they wanted to kiss the stone and so to do this holy act, you're trampling on everybody else. It's like human religion, human nature. And to avoid that, we have the Holy Spirit. That it's, it's, like, it's like what happened with Jesus. It's the holiest people didn't realize that God is right in front of them. And while they're in their pursuit to be holy, they destroy holiness himself. And it's profound, isn't it? And so that's why we need the Holy Spirit, so that we don't just act on impulse and we don't just act on human zeal and we don't just act on human um, religion which can be destructive and so yeah in that way we want to we want to always position ourselves with to live with the holy spirit and it's not it's not like a huge mystical thing on our part we don't have to go crazy or do something crazy for the holy spirit to be working in our lives all we need to do is position ourselves daily that we think when we wake up that it's for God to guide my thoughts it's, it's for God to guide the way that I live today and it's God to make me a conduit for him to work through me to the rest of the world and so that it won't just be um, arguments it won't just be apologetics but it'll be something that I demonstrate something about the kingdom of God that makes people want some of this you know, Jesus said in, in John 3, when Nicodemus came to him, he said, people won't, you won't see the kingdom 
unless you're born of the, of the unless you're born through water and the spirit and so we need the spirit to see the kingdom and so in that way it's more like i would compare it to like a sailboat you'd want to live your life putting up a sail where the holy spirit is able to guide you and, and blow you in the right direction instead of being a rowing boat where you're doing it on your own and you're trying to you know get get through whether it's religiously or just doing life or being driftwood where you're not even rowing at all and you're not being led by the spirit you're just going with the flow of the water into some other place that you don't want to go and so in that way we need the holy spirit and so when we come together as the church like this we remember that we're participating in christ that we're not just following a prophet but somehow through romans 6 we we, we we die through baptism and we were raised with christ and that we as the church come together and we participate with him because his holy spirit is in all of us and when we um take the bread and wine we remember that it's god that it's the holy spirit in us that makes us one that makes us the community that makes us the body of christ but, you know the closest thing that any of us are going to get to jesus or seeing jesus in this world at this time is each other you know because we are as the christians we're the ones who embody him we are the ones who have him on the inside of us and so in that way it, it's completely different from islam or any other religion it's like you know when you read islam or you know the quran or whatever you can see this is this is quite similar but it's not similar you know if you go a few marks away on the compass eventually you get somewhere completely different and so it's a whole different paradigm it's a very different belief system than islam or any other religion and uh, islam is just one of them but there's many others and so it's just knowing that we as christians have something special and it's something to share with the world because we are the answer you know to the world's problems we are the answer to the world that's hurting and so our lives have been transfigured we have been raised with christ and um and i think that's that's where i that's where i that's where i would leave it um i wanted to see if i i didn't look at any of my points at all <laughs> i didn't look at any of them i don't even know if i said any of them <laughs> but um i will give it back to pastor and i'm sure he will invite us to um pray and receive the spirit and um, of course the spirit we all have the spirit in order to be able to believe in the first place even to exist somewhat we, we need the spirit god created everything the spirit was hovering on the waters but for us to believe in the first place means we have the holy spirit but there is other levels as well you know jesus breathed on his disciples after they believed and said receive my spirit and then the day of pentecost came in acts 2 where the spirit came in a very special way and so there are there are journeys with the holy spirit and so i myself i'm going to go there and i'm going to receive more i'm going to open myself more i'm going to position myself more to the spirit's leading so all praise to god <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, do you have any questions? <laughs> I, your testimony is so fascinating. Um, I was wondering if, if you would be willing to share like where you sense God is calling you to now. Like, where is Holy Spirit leading you? Yeah, so that, that, that question there is, um, in some ways, you know, I feel a little bit like a, you know, like a hypocrite because, you know, sometimes God uses somebody that's struggling with those things themselves you know somebody he might give somebody a healing gift but they themselves have sickness and so myself right now i find myself in a place in life where i even you know i'm going through a difficult time where i wonder did i did i hear properly because my whole my whole um vision of life and how i um advise others like if somebody even asks me um what's your advice if if somebody wants to be an actor if i want to be an actor because i'm an actor 
what would you what would you advise for me now my advice is the same as as anybody else it is find out what the will of God is for your life because you know if if, if God doesn't build the house the labor is labor in vain you, you can think you want something but it might not be what you want and it might not be what God wants and so you want to be able to come to the realist point where you're following the Holy Spirit and you feel led and that's what I've done and I've always felt led into acting and it comes with real difficulty though I don't mean that in a glamorous way I don't mean I'm an actor and everything's glamorous it's not it means that as an actor I have a lot of time to study theology I have, because a lot of the times you're not doing anything and so I have a lot of time on my hands <laughs> to study theology and I have a lot of time to pray and I find myself in conversations with people that probably wouldn't have to the chance to have deep conversations with Christians because they don't meet them or you know they're just not able to and so I'm able to get in quite nitty-gritty conversations with people I find that's my greatest gift and my greatest passion and being an actor helps me to do that and sometimes you know when the work dries up and I'm in a country where I'm not allowed to do anything else either that's my visa I'm an actor and so you find yourself sometimes asking Lord am I supposed to be doing this is this what you want me to do but in a way I believe that's a good thing I believe to always live in a surrendered way where you're always coming to God and saying Lord what is the what is your will for my life help me to know what you want me to do and help me to hear it as well and so that's something important especially for young folks as well when you're making decisions about your life and try and think about what are the real desires inside of you not just the ones that have been put in you by others or you might have watched you know American Idol last night and so you might think you want to be a singer tomorrow but it might not be the truest desire that God put in you when you were five years old or something so it's good to, to good it's good to always be connected to the Holy Spirit always surrendering yourself to him and asking him what you want me to do because everybody's got something to do and so for me that is that is what I feel called to do it's to be in um, the pub in, in the um, cultural sphere to help have Chris let Christianity have a voice within the cultural sphere you know I've looked up to actors before who were not even Christian and but they've been good good role models that have helped me in my difficult life to feel pretty good about myself if I was someone like that and a Christian that would be a good thing and even if it's like what I said just having conversations with people who are not Christians who are able to ask me difficult subjects you know whether it's social ones um, relationship ones or whether it's you know theological ones I feel like you know that's that's my biggest thing that I enjoy doing and so that's what I'd like to do yeah that's what I do so much uh, 